Welcome to Conversations with Garmami. This is episode 11. If there's any sponsors out there that, that, that want to reach out to you, how, how, where do they go? Who do they email? Tell us. Plug that, plug that in. MirrorMountainFilmFest.com will have all the information uh, that sponsors and potential advertisers might want to check out. Uh, we have a, a page where you can see uh, the information of the sponsors that we already have, and there's also a Get Involved page where you can find out what we can offer you. Yes, support the arts and creativity, people. Our guest is Christopher Rode. They don't have to make films that look just like everybody else's films in order to get into film festivals. They can make a film that only they would be able to make, and that's the kind of film we want. Christopher Rode is an award-winning filmmaker from Ottawa, Ontario. Christopher is also the festival director of Mirror Mountain Film Festival, which brings the very best in independent, underground, and alternative cinema to Canada's capital. For more information, visit MirrorMountainFilmFest.com. That's one word, MirrorMountainFilmFest.com. He's doing some research on me here. How are you doing? I'm doing excellent, thank you. Let me just fix this. Uh, it sounds. You're familiar with this tool? This, yes, uh, yes. I've used the Zoom before. Right on, right on. So, um, what got you into film? That's a good question. Uh, wow. Uh, well, it probably goes back to um, childhood, I guess. You know, uh, I had uh, a lot of uh, exposure to film uh, as a young person. Um, I was often going, you know, to the cinema with my family. I was uh, being shown uh, films by uh, my older brothers, you know, who were big movie buffs. Uh, so I guess it kind of, uh, you know, just ran in the family, I guess. Uh, but. Uh, as a very young person, I was also very interested in a lot of movies of the day that were coming out uh, that were kind of along the lines of uh, science fiction, you know, fantasy films. Uh, I'm talking about stuff like um, Star Wars, especially um, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, Jaws, Raiders of the Lost Ark, you know, that sort of 70s and 80s kind of wave of uh, genre films. Uh, Robocop is another good one, Gremlins. Um, you know, those are good examples, uh, because, uh, what I noticed about all of those movies is that part of, uh, what people liked about them and what people liked to talk about them was how they were made. Um, it, more so than you would get when you're watching, say, uh, an Oscar winning drama, uh, genre films like science fiction and fantasy tend to often be much more accompanied by production details, you know, how did they make the special effects, how did they do this, how did they do that, you know, how did the little rubber puppets work, or, or whatever it happens to be, you know. Uh, at what point in Jurassic Park are you watching a, a computer animated dinosaur versus what part are you watching a little stop motion puppet? Um, that just seems to be more part of the conversation of films like that, so uh, by being interested in those types of films, I started getting into those conversations, and I started reading uh, a lot of books on how films were made and how special effects were done, uh, even at a very early age, so I was always fascinated by that, uh, and I think um, just making films was kind of a natural progression in a way. What role did uh, your brothers play in that? Uh, you, you said they were big film uh, mm -hmm. film buffs. Uh, elaborate on that. They, were they positive influence? Were they supportive in in your, you know, in your research and whatnot? Uh, well, I think it was more kind of casual at that young age. Uh, it was more just like, hey, check this out. Um, I do recall though that my older brothers. I mean, this was the '80s. Remember when things were a little bit more relaxed uh, with regards to uh, you know showing kids scary movies. Uh, you know, I think they probably definitely showed me some movies that uh, I shouldn't have seen when I was five or six years old. Uh, uh, but what's funny is that the uh, the movies I was most frightened by, uh, like Jaws, for instance, are still among the most favorite of my films uh, to watch today, and mm. I, I return to them often. Uh, so I think there's something to be said for, uh, you know, kind of uh, the shock of exposure <laughs> mm. to uh, to a young person's mind, you know. Um, you know, uh, nowadays I think it's uh, a different culture. Back in the 80s, uh, you know, you used to get uh, toys in the toy stores and, and trading cards in Halloween, um, you know, with Freddy Krueger and, and Jason and, and Alien and Predator and all of them on it. Um, in, a, in a way, I think uh, back in the 80s, uh, culture in general was just more permissive uh, in a way for that kind of stuff. Uh, now I think things are a bit more kind of protected. Um, so I think, uh, yeah, just being a product of that uh, culture and that time 
uh, was a, a huge influence for sure. And my brothers were kind of the guardians of that culture. Uh, he'd be like, here, here's Robocop. Don't tell your mom and dad. Let me show you this. <laughs> uh, you know, so I, I got exposed to a lot of, uh, you know, kind of very strong uh, images and, and ideas through mm. my family. Did you grow up in Ottawa? I did, yes. Where, where did you go to, uh, to high school? Uh, well, actually, I only attended um, grade school here in Ottawa. I actually moved away. Uh, for several years to uh, England, and I actually went to high school there. Cool. So that was a whole other experience with a whole other culture. How was that? Uh, you know, it was uh, it was different. <laughs> it was nothing like I ever would have uh, expected, really. Um, Good different, bad different, uh, indifferent different? <laughs> <laughs> a little of both, I guess. Um, you know, England has... Uh, a much richer culture, I have to say, than um, you find in North America. Um, you know, people are much more in tune with uh, British food in Britain uh, than they are in Canada with Canadian food. You know, they're more in tune with their television, with their film, with their theater. Uh, you know, in England, you still have poet laureates, for God's sakes. You know, you haven't seen that in, in North America for a long time. Um, but on the other hand, you know, it, uh, it's a culture like any other, and it has its ups and downs, I guess. Uh, there were things that I liked very much about living there, and uh, there were things that I did not like very much about living there, uh, like the weather, for instance. Sure. <laughs> did, uh, did, were you watching a lot of film? Uh, like... I was, actually, yeah. And, um, British one, film? Yes, yes. One of the, the big, big influences on me as a teenager was discovering uh, Film 4, uh, film 4 is a, a wing of uh, Channel 4 television in England. Um, at the time when I lived there, there were still only four channels on TV, uh, two of which were uh, BBC 1 and 2, uh, and then there was ITV 3 and Channel 4. And Channel 4 was kind of like the cool channel mm. um, that programmed more kind of uh, independent. and. Uh, was it cool because it was in even number? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it was it was cool for a lot of reasons, uh, probably including that one. Um, yeah, and they would show a lot of independent films, uh, and especially a lot of British productions um, mm. that uh, they had produced or you know supported through their uh, Film Four initiative. Um, all sorts of famous films were produced. Uh, through this initiative, you know, films like Train Spotting and Shallow Grave, uh, wow. Mona Lisa, um, you know, uh, what else? The Full Monty, even, I think. Um, you know, ev everything basically that ever made it big uh, mm. in the last, you know, 15 to 20 years as a British export was probably produced through Film 4. Um, they even produced, I think, Shaun of the Dead and stuff. Uh, really? The more recent films. Yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah so uh, they also had a channel on. Um, subscription t uh, TV, uh, Film 4 channel, like you had to pay, you know, five bucks a month or something for it. And they would run classic films basically 24 hours a day on this thing. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, this is before the internet. This is before Netflix. This is before, you know, anything really. This is old school time. So you wanted to see like, you know, uh, some culture, you know, you had to basically either read about it in a book or a magazine or, or stumble upon a, a service like this. Uh, so I signed up for it and, uh, you know, this is how I saw the films of, you know, Jean-Luc Godard and Robert Bresson and Francois Truffaut and, uh... I don't know anything. <laughs> <laughs> but can, can please keep talking. Classic old French dudes, basically. Okay. Uh, but they would run these old, you know, uh, black and white art films from the, the 40s and 50s and 60s and 70s, you know, 24 hours a day. So I was exposed to uh, many, 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 many classics uh, before I even set foot in film school, mm. uh, which was great. Uh, and it really kind of expanded my horizons and probably also showed me some things I shouldn't have seen at that age, too. Mm. <laughs> That's not bad, though, because you, you were exposed to, to reality. Right. What, uh, where, did you, uh, where did you do your undergrad? Where did you do your undergrad I did my undergraduate and graduate degrees at Carleton University, okay. uh, and they were both in film studies. What uh, were you, so la last year of high school, mm. take us back to last year of high school, were you thinking, what were you thinking at the time as far as um, what subject matter you wanted to 
to study. W- w- was it film? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Like a hundred percent. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. In my last year of high school, I uh, had the opportunity of being able to choose uh, electives, which was great. Wait, it means was I, this back in England? Or? This was in England, right. yeah, okay. uh, which was awesome because it meant I didn't have to do gym anymore mm. or math <laughs> <laughs> uh, or any of the things that I was bad at, uh, and I could focus on things I was really good at. Your strengths. Yeah, yes. so I took uh, English literature and media studies, mm. uh, and I just kind of immersed myself fully in, in both things as much as I could. So, uh, yeah, I, I was aware that uh, I liked to be involved in uh, film and, you know, media and, you know, just sort of creative things, I guess. What, um, going from, uh, from, so you finished high school in England, yeah? Mm-hmm. And, and when you applied at Carleton, what drew you to, uh, to Ottawa? I mean, you, you grew up here. I grew up here, yeah. So is, is it kind of returning home type of... Uh, it was, yeah. Um, I had never really, uh, you know, I wasn't old enough when I lived here the first time to really have seen a lot of uh, the country, I guess. Um, so, you know, when it came time to come back to Canada uh, to go to school, you know, Ottawa was just, I guess, the place I had the most familiarity with. Um, mm. I had never really spent much time in places like Montreal or Toronto, apart from, you know, a few hours or something sure. uh, on a day trip. Um, so I really didn't feel like I knew the cities well enough or, or Halifax or, or Winnipeg or whatever. Uh, I mean, I've traveled to those places now and, you know, I've experienced a lot more of them now. Um, but at the time it just seemed like, yeah, uh, Ottawa is what I knew best. I felt like I would be on you know, stable ground there. What do you think about the city in general? Um... <laughs> Uh, putting you on the spot. Wow, okay. Uh, right, and, and then tell me what you think about the city in general, and then about its uh, its art scene, its creative, hmm. the, the creative class or whatever community here, and, and in particular with video and, and visual storytelling. Right. Uh, okay, well, you know, it's it's always the case that um, hindsight is twenty twenty, right? you always experience uh, a place more strongly after you've left it. Mm. Uh, or you're able to kind of put it into words more clearly. Uh, when you're in a place and when you're there, you're so wrapped up in just the moment of existence that it's it's kind of hard to put a, a big umbrella over all of your experiences and be able to sum them up in a, in a few sentences. Um, <laughs> you know, I felt like I had a better idea of Canadian culture after I left Canada to go to England, and then I had a better idea of English culture after I left England to come back to Canada. Uh, and, you know, that I think that extends to uh, the world of, you know, film uh, and video and uh, people making movies as well. Um, you know, if you were to ask me, you know, how would you describe the Ottawa film scene? I'd be like, well, I don't know. You know, it's kind of complex. You know, everybody's doing their own different things. You know, people are working in different groups or different organizations. Some people are making documentaries. Some people are making animation. Some people are making... Porn. (laughs) Or other things. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, And, you know, it's kind of hard to just say, like, oh, well, you can sum up the entire scene, you know, as such. Uh, But interestingly enough, I was recently in... Uh, St. John's in Newfoundland Mm -hmm. uh, to attend the Nickel Independent Film Festival there, uh, which was uh, turning 15 this year. And they had a lot of local films in the selection there. And when, you know, I went, I was figuring, oh, you know, some more local films, it'll be just like the local films back home. I mean, you know, Mm -hmm. after all, we're all Canadian, right? And it turned out that they were so different uh, than the types of films that we make here. You know, they were really more in tune with an East Coast kind of maritime culture. You know, Mm -hmm. they had more references uh, and uh, locations and things that connected to uh, Newfoundland and Nova Scotia and PEI and and New Brunswick um, and just kind of like the Atlantic coast and the fisheries and uh, all the different industries that are, uh, you know, either on the rise or in decline in that particular part of Canada. Uh, and yeah, I mean, like it, it went beyond just the regional accent. Like it just, it was really clear to me that like, wow, this is like seeing films from a whole different country almost. Mm. Um, just people just don't make this kind of film because they're not in the same kind of environment. Uh, regionalization, I think they call it. 
Yeah, Probably yeah, it, it could be a regional type of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's probably the case with Ottawa too. You know, if when you're in Ottawa and you're involved in that community, it's harder to see what it's like. But if you ask an outsider, mm -hmm. uh, if you ask someone from Arizona mm -hmm. to come here or from, uh, you know, Ulaanbaatar, Mongolia, sure, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> or from Malaysia or or from you know Tibet or or from anywhere really right. uh, to comment on the Ottawa filmmaking scene. Mm. <laughs> Not that you would get someone uh, to do that, but uh, if you were, I'm sure they would probably you know be able to be more insightful about it than uh, you could be yourself because when you're in a situation, it's it's all often more difficult to see. So you have you've, you've you've given me an interesting answer, but you haven't answered the <laughs> question, which which is fine. But what, what uh, I, I guess if you don't mind, I'm I'm gonna follow up and and, and say what stories are being told uh, in the national capital region in the Ottawa Gatineau hmm. film community. What what vibes are you getting from um, from films that that you've seen in, in this uh, that that are produced locally? independently and what have you what well i think the this is another non-answer so you're probably gonna that's get fine that. no, no no i'm not gonna get mad I, I'm, I'm enjoying this I, I i understand you know it's it's complicated right? yeah there's many yeah. different pockets i guess the the best answer to give really is that um you know the scene is extremely diverse mm -hmm. uh that um it's not like everybody is working on the same kind of stuff it's not as if everybody in the whole town are all working on documentaries about the environment or, uh, you know, horror movies about guys in long robes with knives mm -hmm. chasing after you down dark hallways. Um, you know, you probably get both of those things, but you also uh, get, uh, you know, every possible kind of style and approach and, and topic under the sun as well. Um, and I think any screening of uh, locally produced films will, will bear that out. Uh, you'll see a variety of different genres and styles and perspectives um, and a lot of different unique voices hmm. when uh, when you went to uh, how, how was your undergrad experience undergrad and, and graduate experience at Carleton? uh it was interesting did, did, w did you want to uh, it, so you did film studies I did Carleton, yeah. eh? was there a production aspect of it not at all did, did you purposely did, did you want to do production uh? absolutely <laughs> okay. uh, it, there was definitely uh, some kind of uh, indication that there might be production courses at Carlson at the time they were listed in the course calendar uh, but then you know in in tiny little letters and parentheses underneath that not offered at this time yes, yes. to sort of make you believe that maybe they would be offered at a later time but yeah. they were never offered at a later time uh, I understand actually that they're only now beginning to uh, create um, an equipment depot of cameras and, and lighting equipment and so forth at Carleton University and to offer uh, practical uh, hands-on filmmaking courses there for undergraduates uh, only like this year Really? Uh, and I was an undergraduate the there 15 yeah. years ago, mm. so it was a long time to wait. <laughs> yes, the journalism department have production equipment, and as do the history department. Really? Yes, uh, but film studies uh, are just basically getting theirs now. So, That's uh, ironic. Nod. Yeah, it was. So it was an interesting um, and kind of... Uh, different sort of experience than what I was expecting. You know, I was expecting to just walk into a room full of gear and, you know, start working at it, basically, you know, mm -hmm. put a tool in your hand. Uh, I thought it would kind of almost be like more of a college thing, I guess. Right. Uh, but I was okay with the fact that it wasn't because I, you know, from my experiences uh, as a youth, you know, doing a lot of reading and research on my own, I was very interested in cinema history as mm -hmm. a topic anyway. So it was of interest. It just... Uh, it didn't really help me get to where I wanted to go, I guess. Where did you want to go? Uh, I wanted to get somewhere where I could get a camera in my hand, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, and eventually I discovered that there are uh, production cooperatives in Ottawa that will let you sign up for uh, you know, a low-priced membership in order to rent equipment at a subsidized rate. And mm -hmm. uh, around my third year of my undergraduate degree, I discovered Saw Video. Uh, which is in the arts court, and uh, they did exactly that. They they take uh, 
a nominal membership fee from you, um, and in exchange you are allowed to rent out a huge variety of high quality, professional grade, industrial standard filmmaking equipment, and they offer a great variety of workshops on how to use them. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was uh, kind of what I had been looking for all along, uh, and I started to pursue that outside of my academic studies. Talk to us about that, uh, being able to, uh, was that a, um, how was that, like, going to school and, and learning the history of, of cinema and different genres, theories mm. and so on, and critical, you know, writing critical papers on, on this film, and then going to this film, uh, going to soft video, mm -hmm. and, you know, learning about lighting, in right. terms of, you know, three-point lighting and, and all that, how, how, how was that, uh, how did that differ? It's a very different skill set. Um, I would, you know, often try in my early kind of steps as a filmmaker to uh, apply one set of knowledge to the other, uh, you know, to take some ideas I had been working out in an academic paper, um, you know, uh, being sort of like a criticism of film X, Y, or Z, or whatever it happens to be, uh, and I'm like, oh, I'm going to turn that into a movie, and it never worked. It would always end up being uh, very dry, very cerebral, um, academic. In fact, a lot of people just wouldn't be able to really understand what I was trying to say at all. Really? Uh, in the films, yeah, um, they were really bad. <laughs> are, are, are they? Are they? Uh, are they online? Oh dear God, no. <laughs> you, you don't screen them, or? or... Uh, no, I mean, you know, I, I made a lot of short films when I was uh, in that kind of period of my undergraduate sure, sure. degree, and I just sort of consider them practice, I guess. Sure. Um, which is weird, you know, that kind of gets me on to another uh, topic, and that's kind of the difference between uh, film and music uh, when it comes to cultural expectations. Uh, when you're a filmmaker, um, you know, I make films sometimes, and, you know, they don't turn out super well, and I just shelve them, basically, start on the next one. Uh, or, you know, come back to it later and maybe rework it somehow. Uh, and, you know, they're not all successes, and I don't necessarily promote them all, and I don't uh, publish them all and, you know, try and get them out there or submit them to festivals and that kind of thing. Some of them I just consider sort of buried, in a way, because they're just practice attempts. Uh, when you're a musician, that's normal. You know, that's just called jamming. Mm -hmm. When you're a musician, you don't publish every single jam session you ever do and expect it to be, you know, rated and reviewed by the public some stuff you just practice and then you know when you feel like you've gotten good enough at something then you release it out into the world and you know expect it to be dissected and torn apart by everybody else uh, but in film it, there's much more of an ex expectation I guess that it's like you worked on something you, we gotta see it um, so I've always done that kind of uh, a funny difference I guess between the two mediums mm -hmm. uh, but yeah I made lots of practice films back in those days uh, I made probably close to 20 uh, practice short films that were just just terrible, just awful. But uh, when, some of them I showed say, to people. <laughs> when you say they're they're how are they terrible? Uh, I are, guess, you, are you are you just uh, like being you know uh, you're, you're being critical or you're you're being hard on yourself? Sure, they're practice films, but mm -hmm. are they? I mean, uh, how do you know they're really that? bad? Like, have you have you screened them to too many people? And do you know what I mean? Because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, sometimes it would just be a matter of showing them to uh, big, friends. There's a big industry out there for bad movies. <laughs> Do you know, true. if if you're looking from the business side, yeah. right? And I mean, it's probably not right to to measure, uh, you know, artistic value by 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 you know x amount of views or how many you know DVDs you've sold or how many. You know what I mean? It, it's like food. Mm -hmm. Like people mm -hmm. eat at McDonald's or they go to. Or they eat at home. What's the difference? At home, it's quality. You know. Anyways, but the the point is, how, how do you know these films? Like now, you. I'm really curious to see these films because when, we, when you say that they're, they're like, how do you know they're that bad? Like, what well, what are you basing? Well, what's your standard? What's the the metrics that you're? Well, I did show them to a few people. Okay. I mean, like I, I would show them to close friends, you know, uh, or or girlfriends, or you know, uh, family members sometimes. Sure. Uh, and get their feedback. Um, and, you know, I did also a few uh, screenings in a kind of um, lo-fi sort of community sort of setting. Uh, you know, the sort of thing where 
you and your friends would sort of put on a little show and like you know your friend's band would play a few songs and it's like hey I have a short film let's play that as well uh, and I would you know kind of study I guess the reaction uh, that the crowd would have and I would talk to people afterwards about you know their idea of what the film was about and I learned very quickly that I was not good at communicating in film uh, and I feel like this is a problem a lot of amateur filmmakers have. Uh, the ideas are all in their head. They know what it's about. They know not just the subject matter, but what they want to express conceptually or thematically, um, you know, the soul of the piece in a way. Uh, but they have a hard time using the film or the book or the play or the song or whatever it happens to be uh, as a gateway to put that in the soul of someone else. Uh, and that's really what it has to be about. You have to take what's inside of yourself and transfer it into another human being, uh, which is easier said than done. If you could do that, then you know you could be Steven Spielberg tomorrow. You could be Mozart. Uh, you could be Louis Armstrong. You could be any genius of uh, of uh, you know whatever medium or or artistic form uh, that you wanted to be. Uh, that's what we all are looking for, I guess. Um, so I learned very quickly that that was really important, and I started trying to just basically get better at conveying through film what I wanted to say. Uh, and that's been a long process. I still don't think I'm super good at that. I still think that's an area I need to get better in. But um, yeah, basically what I noticed was that uh, I had an idea of what my film was about, but when I talked to people, they saw something completely different or didn't see anything at all. Sometimes they would just say, oh, you know, it was some nice images, but I didn't understand what it was about and what it meant. Uh, and I also kind of... Uh, joined with that, realized that uh, I was definitely being way too academic in my approach. Wow. Uh, that I was trying to convey uh, very complex ideas that I had been interested in through school. Can you give us an example? Like, uh... Oh gosh, like, um, you know, like if I was interested in, you know, ideas about uh, like the work of art, you know, in the age of mechanical reproduction, you know, the kind of Walter Benjamin uh, idea of art being industrialized in the 20th century through, you know, machines, you know, cinema is a machine, the film projector is a machine, all of these types of things. Um, they're mechanized, they're regulated, you know, they come across uh, at a mathematical rate, uh, which makes them different from things like, say, theater, which are more organic and, you know, uh, kind of fuzzy-duzzy. Um, and yeah, basically just kind of like academic ideas like that, theories that had been sort of circulating around film studies or that were popular in film studies. And I thought, ooh, wouldn't it be nice to make a film about that? So the, the, the point would be that the audience member would say at the end of the film, oh, I understand now that cinema is, you know, uh, a mechanically regulated art form, unlike painting which is more organic and you just do this for as much as you want. You know, I'm waving my arm here <laughs> <laughs> for the benefit of the radio audience. Right. Uh, you know, that there's something more kind of uh, structured or, or modernistic or whatever about cinema. But, you know, then I would ask the film you know, audience, uh, hey, you know, what, what did you think about this, this short film? And they would say, oh, yeah, was, I, I love the part where there was like a green circle and then it turned into like an orange square. And, you know, that would be the extent of what they would get. They wouldn't understand... Uh, all of these kind of uh, theoretical ideas I was trying to get across. Did it frustrate you? Did it frustrate you? Did it annoy you? Did it, did, what was the in, you know natural reaction to that? Uh, to them not understanding well, this this art that you're you're you know what I mean? Yeah. Putting out. How did you feel about it? You know, I was definitely disappointed um, and definitely frustrated. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think more than anything, I started to sort of feel less and less into uh, academia at that point. I think that was the real trigger there, um, is that those kind of reactions and those feedbacks uh, made me realize that I wanted to be less in the academic world and more in the filmmaking world. Now, did your fellow academics, in, in you know, your, the fellow grad students and profs, when you, did you show them these, these films? A little bit, yeah. These were some oh. of the people that I got feedback from, for sure, yeah. And, and what kind of feedback were, were they giving you? Oh, very much the same, basically. Really? Yeah, yeah. But they're insiders they're in, in, in the community, you know, of, of yeah. film academics, and, and they still couldn't... Well, it's not uh, through any uh, fault of theirs. It's sure, not, of not course. like they I'm weren't, you know, smart people or anything. I, I'm not even. I'm yeah, not, I'm no, not... it, it had everything to do with the fact that, uh, you know, I 
was not a good storyteller, basically. Uh, and, you know, maybe it wasn't always necessarily a story-based film. Maybe I was trying to do something uh, more experimental. You know, sort of experimental or abstract or something. But I'm, I'm using storytelling as kind of like a catch-all term for just communicating with the audience. Um, you know, I've Is it important s- to communicate with the audience? It's the most essential thing, for sure. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Absolutely. You know, I've seen lots of uh, experimental films uh, by some of the great experimental filmmakers ever like who um, educate us on oh gosh uh everyone from you know uh joyce Wheland and michael snow to steve rinke and mike holbum uh, <laughs> 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 those are your fellow canadians here <laughs> really oh yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> no not fv but uh-huh. later a little bit later from okay. nfb and uh you know you could watch one of their films and you would be able to receive all of these very complex uh theoretical concepts and stuff you know those are people who uh, had the skill or the talent for being able to not only relate that information successfully to the audience, but also do it in an emotional way, mm-hmm. where the audience don't just think but also feel. And I think that's what I wanted to to emulate, I guess. Um, and so I started focusing more and more on that. And uh, as a result, I think the films that I've produced since that time have become less and less and less uh, conceptual, I guess, and more and more visceral. I've become much more interested in uh, just trying to capture people emotionally, I guess, and uh, sort of produce uh, a rush of, of feeling or excitement or color in some way. Did you enjoy grad school overall? Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't have stuck with it for the entire two and a half years if I was having that bad of a time. Uh, I was still motivated enough to finish it because, you know, like I said before, um, even though it wasn't quite what I had gone into school in the first place to try and do. Um, it was still subject matter that was interesting to me. Did, did you do a thesis? Did you, I did, did you, yes. What was your thesis on? Oh boy. Uh, my thesis was on the correspondence between romantic poetry and art in general of you know the Victorian era and contemporary experimental film travelogues. So I looked at uh, films that had been made in the 20th century um, in the experimental film kind of genre uh, that were travel films, you know, about going to you know different places around the world, voyages, trips, journeys, uh, and basically compared them to uh, romantic literature from you know Wordsworth's day, um, which was fascinating to me at the time. But even just saying it out loud right now makes me think that I would have been better off just working those two years. <laughs> Oh, getting a real job. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> oh, God. Who oh, boy. <laughs> He's blushing. <laughs> but uh, it was fun. You know, I was really into um, a lot of Victorian literature at the time. I still am to an extent. You know, I still love reading um, you know, Frankenstein. I just finished rereading Frankenstein again recently. How many times have you read it? Uh, three. Okay. Uh, you know, I love reading you know, Jules Verne and Journey to the Center of the Earth and... Um, you know, all of that sort of thing. So I was really interested in um, kind of gothic, romantic travel literature and how it corresponds to cinema. But uh, not very many other people were. <laughs> in, in 06, uh, your film, uh, The Pink uh, Ghosts, to tell us about that, because it says here that it was uh, selected for the inaugural edition of En Route, like uh, it was screened nationally. Uh, in a way, yeah, yeah. So that was um, that was interesting. That was the first time that I ever really kind of made a big deal out of one of my films, um, like in the production of it, in the actual planning and execution of it. Uh, everything that I had made up until that point was kind of just quickly thrown off in a weekend. You know, I'd shoot it in a day, I'd edit it the next day, I'd consider it done on the third day, basically. And I didn't really mind because I was still practicing, basically, my skills and uh sort of uh, figuring out what I wanted to say. Uh, but with the Pinkos, it was like a huge thing. I, like, I spent almost a year, I think, on that film. Um, and I was lucky enough to get a Jumpstart grant from Saw Video. Uh, Saw Video uh, offer uh, this grant called the Jumpstart Grant, uh, which has been on since the early 90s, I think, or at least the mid-90s. Uh, and it's still running today. Uh, and it's a great opportunity for emerging filmmakers to be able to professionalize uh, their first film uh, to be able to do it with you know the right equipment and take workshops and all of that 
Um, it's a lot more kind of uh, mentor oriented now. Uh, now they actually team you up with a more experienced filmmaker who shows you the ropes, which is wonderful. Uh, but back then when I got mine, it was much more self-directed. Um, but, you know, that was okay too because I was a very self-directed person. Um, and I was more than eager to take the workshops and learn, you know, the skills and all of that myself anyway. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I worked on it for uh, a really long time. It basically transformed uh, my apartment into a movie set for, you know, eight months or something. Mm. I had this great big giant uh, table about uh, six feet by six feet across, about four and a half feet high, with a giant Lazy Susan uh, built into the, the center of it that I made, you know, um, from like home hardware. Um, so basically it would, it would rotate. Um, and uh, on top of that, I built uh, this miniature set, I guess, um, with all these sort of... Uh, model railroad pieces and uh, toys and uh, other scale models that uh, I borrowed from family members. Uh, my uncle is a big toy train collector, so I was able to draw on his collection of little buildings and tracks and uh, little people and cars and all sorts of things like that. But a lot of it I started uh, making as well because I realized that I didn't have enough to actually fill up the whole table uh, to make the set. Uh, and that's actually how I got into making my own miniatures, which I do a lot in my artistic work now. Um, I do a lot of model building and maquette building and uh, diorama building. And that's kind of how I got into it in the first place, was out of necessity. It's like, oh god, I, I need to fill up half of this table, it's, it's looking empty. Uh, so I built a few you know, very simple things, and barns and fences and stuff like that, with popsicle sticks. And uh, once it was all kind of assembled and this whole sort of little miniature world was uh, there, um, I basically set up a camera in front of it and uh, just gave the thing a spin, basically. So uh, what you see in the film is uh, this sort of sense of the whole world kind of passing by very quickly, uh, as if you're going around the globe very, very fast, um, and the seasons change and, uh, you know, the, the sort of scene changes and stuff as you're going. Uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, it was a very long and very complicated uh, production and uh, I think I learned a lot um, you know trial by error style really and when I was just about done uh, a teacher of mine at the university uh, told me about this opportunity um, again this was kind of like pre-internet in a way sort of days like internet was around obviously in 2006 but uh, internet culture, especially for filmmakers, wasn't really much of a thing yet. Uh, nowadays, filmmakers have access to all sorts of websites and blogs and Tumblr lists and God knows what else that list all the different filmmaking opportunities that are available, different festivals you can apply to, different competitions you can enter, and so forth. People are just you know sharing them on constantly on social media, on Facebook. You know, every day you see a call for entry for something else. Uh, but back then, like, you really had to, like, hear about that kind of thing from somebody else. Mm. Uh, and so, uh, this professor of mine, uh, you know, handed me this application form that I guess, uh, had been sent by Air Canada to Carleton, just in case, uh, one of their students happened to be a filmmaker. And I guess I was probably the only grad student that was really seriously involved in filmmaking at that time mm. in film. Uh, so she handed me the application form and I filled it out and I sent them a copy of the DVD and to my great surprise, uh, they wrote me back to say that they were going to be playing, uh, my short film, The Pink Ghosts, on the Air Canada, uh, in-flight movie selection, wow. um, which they had just christened En Route, um, and were calling a film festival at the time. They don't brand it as a film festival anymore, now it's just the En Route selection, you sure. know? You get in an airplane seat and you plunk down and there's your screen in front of you and you, you know, you pick uh, what you want to watch if it's Big Bang Theory or CBC News or, right, right. or you know, Sesame Street or whatever it is. Uh, but back then in 2006, it was like a big deal, you know, it was like they didn't have nearly as big of a selection of films. Um, mm -hmm. You know, back then, you know, the screens that were included in your movie seat, uh, in your movie seat, sorry, in your airline seat, <laughs> uh, were brand new. And, you know, they had like one episode of the news, two feature films to choose from, and four short films. Right. And mine was one of the four short films. Damn, that's awesome. Uh, that's huge, isn't it? It was, it was huge, yeah. And for years afterwards, for at least three years, I would have people just recognizing me all the time. Uh, be like, oh, you made that movie. I saw it on an airplane. Oh. 
uh, you know, I'd be telling people about it. It's like, oh yeah, you know, I had this last film of mine. It was played on an airplane. It was with miniatures. I'm like, oh yeah, I saw that when I was going to Puerto Rico. And people would say and that to me it's all a global the audience, time, right? Because yeah. you have you have people uh, traveling Air Canada from all over the world. From all over the world, are, yeah, are are traveling to every continent. So yeah. God knows. Do do you know? Do you have the stats as to the number of? Uh, do they collect? They many, did, and did uh, they disclose that? To you? They did. Yeah, it was something crazy, like two point five million views. Holy shit. But it was there for like a year and a half. It was in the, the selection got bigger and bigger. Like every couple of months, they would sure. expand it with a couple more short films and a, you know another feature and maybe another newsreel or something. Could you imagine if you've gotten a quarter per view? Like 10 cents per <laughs> I didn't get paid anything. Oh, but I mean, you got the exposure. You got your, your no. you know what I mean. Your your film yeah. out. No, exposure but, doesn't pay the rent. No, it doesn't. But I mean, in <laughs> hindsight, could you imagine if you said, "Yeah, sure." Uh, how about you give me a nickel per view? Right. You know, because by now... <laughs> that would have been a good deal, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, the, the the selection that they had there kept getting bigger and bigger as time went on. So probably people watched it less and less than they would have in that initial period when the selection was much smaller. But, yeah, it was in the selection for uh, about a year and a half, and it got seen, like, more than a million times. So, uh, yeah, that was great. That was... Definitely a, a and, and highlight. And moments ago, dude, you were telling me that people weren't getting your film and, and shit. And, and now, you know, how, how did they make you feel overall in terms of, of that, that opportunity of, of, uh, of, of having your film being part of En Route's, uh, you know, mm. Well, I, I still don't know if anyone liked it. Or if they understood it. But you but know what? The they number saw of it. views. <laughs> they saw it. You know, if, if you're a web stats person, that number of yeah. views speak, you know, hey, you know what? It's 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 five minutes, right? It's about Yeah, it's about five minutes, yeah. Yeah, I mean so mm -hmm. like and that's what's great about short films, people you know what I mean, will watch mm -hmm. uh, I, I mean I'm 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 assuming I a film that is short. I I'd rather watch, you know, under twenty minutes than three hours. Right. You know, even on a flight, you know. Uh, sure, people have a little more limited attention span. ADD culture. Right? Yeah, it's... on a especially on a flight, you know, they're tired and you know they want a nap or they they're waiting for the drink cart to come around. Exactly, <laughs> exactly, exactly. They only have five minutes, really, the window of opportunity to reach them anyway. So, in hindsight, what did that opportunity? What, what does that? When you look back, what does it all mean to you in terms of that opportunity, the mm. exposure? And, and where you are now. This is uh, about a decade, nine years ago. It was, God, nine years ago, wow. Uh. Well, what, what does it mean? I'm putting you on the spot here. Yeah. He's, he's, he's getting grilled. <laughs> uh, I think it was a great uh, kick in the butt for me to professionalize my practice. Uh, because before then, I had never shown my films in a public setting in a professional context. It was only ever in a kind of community context where it's like, hey, you know, Billy, you put on your short film and then Roger will put on his short film and then, you know, whoever will put on theirs. And then, you know, someone will read a poem and a band will play. Uh, this was like not something that I had organized myself. This was somebody else saying, we picked you. We've selected It's a you. vote of confidence. It's a vote of confidence, absolutely. And I think uh, that's, um, uh, you know, a kind of ignition uh, that a lot of uh, young filmmakers should get and that a lot of amateur filmmakers should get. It, it really puts uh, a fire under your butt mm -hmm. and tells you, hey, you know, I need to get some more of these. Uh, so after that, I really started working a lot harder on getting uh, The Pink Ghosts played in other film festivals. I started making applications to other film festivals. I started getting it shown. Uh, it started being played, you know, across the country. And I started working towards... A second film, a follow-up, basically, um, in a lot of ways, kind of like a remake of the Pinko, sort of a bigger and better version called Odd One Out. Uh, and I thought, okay, well, I'll really professionalize this one. I'll apply for grants. I'll get funding. I'll actually shoot it in a studio environment. I'll have actors. I'll pay the actors, and then I'll, you know, get it shown in even more festivals. Mm -hmm. And um, that is what happened. But what I didn't expect was for it to take so long. Because it took like six years or something? It took six years. Hmm. Uh, I was expecting it to be done within the next... Six months? One to two years, max, right. yeah. I, I thought it would be like a 2008 release, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I don't think we even finished filming until 2011. Hmm. 
So it was a long, long haul for sure. Was it worth that? Uh... Can, can you control that? But, you know, it, it, do, do you know what I mean? Like in terms of s- scheduling the time and, and you know, all, all the all the labor that's, that's mm. involved. Like, I mean... I think uh, what would have been a much better idea would have been to do a whole series of slightly less ambitious projects mm. and to be able to use each one of those to slightly get more and more momentum. and more momentum and more and more and more professionalism and more quality and more, you know, filmmaking standard and all of that um, rather than kind of put all my eggs in, in one basket, which is what I did. Uh yeah, I mean, in hindsight, I think I was uh, a little too ambitious. I think I bit off a little bit more than I can chew. You made a huge omelet, though. It, it's, 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 it's a huge Denny's-style omelet, so bring your friends, because you're going <laughs> to need help eating it. <laughs> right on. Right on. I mean, but you hear, okay, when you say uh, it was you were overambitious, I think you said, what's wrong with that? Well, nothing at the time. Uh, at the time, it was great. Okay. Um, but, but you're making it sound like you know, you know <laughs> what I mean. Like, okay, uh, you 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 jumped into the deep end, yeah. You know, and, and you swam in it for for six years, and you yeah. know, you you put out a product. At the end of the day, at least you you completed it. I did you eventually. I it, eventually you know? did complete it. It's true. Mm-hmm. Um, but I guess it would be kind of like if you were. Uh, you know, a kind of uh, young amateur musician and you decided, you know, you you had just finished maybe doing your first professional single, you know, and you you recorded it all nice and you thought, oh, this is great, people like this. For my next project, I'm going to record a triple album with the London Symphony Orchestra and Mm -hmm. have like a hundred piece, you know, concert orchestra, you know, and make it like this huge, giant thing because you you figure, okay, now I know how to do this properly. Now I'm going to do it as big as humanly possible and you know part of that was the fun of it part of that was kind of the excitement that drew me to kind of do the project in the first place but uh, (laughs) in hindsight it was uh, a lot more exhausting and time-consuming than I thought it would be Mm. Um, and uh, I think I'm probably not going to try that again anytime soon uh, because I don't want it to take another six years to finish but yeah, I mean, it was a great learning process, uh, and I definitely learned a lot more than I would have had I not been so foolhardy as to take on uh, a short like that. So there's a lot of lessons learned. From, oh, absolutely. In terms of value there for, for, for the journey, there's a lot of... It was worthwhile. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think I learned not just about um, uh, how not to make a film technically <laughs> on, a, on a technological and a production level, but I think I learned how not to make a film uh, on a storytelling level as well. Uh, because much like my older work, uh, I have shown this to a lot of people now, mm-hmm. and I've you know, studied their uh, response to it, and you know, I've, I've asked them questions afterwards about it, and uh, the conclusion I've come to is that a lot of people still don't get it. <laughs> so obviously I still need some work to do on my storytelling and communication skills uh, because, uh, you know... Oh, wait a minute, you won an award for this thing. I have won two. Well, there you, so some people get it. <laughs> some people do, yes. Uh, and that's great, and that's wonderful. But, um, you know, it, I think you always kind of learn more from criticism than you do from... Uh, congratulations, mm-hmm. you know, congratulations feel wonderful, uh, and, you know, they're great to have, and they're very encouraging, and they can help fuel your, your passion and your fire, but I think ultimately criticism is what you'll learn from the most. And you're, you're a realist, then. You, you, you value that, the criticism over the... In a way, in a way, I mean, like, in a sense, I'm a realist, but in another sense, I'm kind of a fantasist, because I spend all of my time and resources and money, you know, making little plastic creatures that fight each other mm-hmm. and do very silly things with them. Dude, uh-huh. that's amazing. That's fucking dope. It's better than, than uh, working in a cubicle and, you know... And, and it could be, yeah. I think it is, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what... Uh, tell us which awards you won. I think one was at the Independent Video Awards? Yes, Award? yes. I was uh, very fortunate to have been awarded... Uh, um, statue for uh, best director in the experimental category mm-hmm. uh, but it was for this specific film so it wasn't like best experimental film I was winning the award for best experimental filmmaker but it was with representation to this particular film mm. 
And uh, before that, uh, back in November, I believe, I got the film for, um, it's not the film, I won the award for uh, Best Emerging Filmmaker at mm. the Jasper Short Film Festival uh, in Jasper, Alberta, uh, which was which was nice. Um, it was kind of, uh, to my chagrin though, uh, you know, to uh, have been working on films for close to 10 years, mm. uh, to have made probably more than 30 short films, and to only now uh, be winning an award called Best Emerging Filmmaker. Wow. Yeah. Um, so that was a bit of a double-edged sword. Um, but, you know, I was happy to get it anyway, and I was mm. very grateful uh, for, you know, having won anything, really. You know, it was the first time I've ever won an award for a film, so uh, it was a very, very nice experience. Tell us about your film festival and why you started it. You want to talk about Mirror Mountain? And I'm going to jump, I'm going to jump back to... to... Okay. So th this is where we get a little... Okay, we're getting a little non-linear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. We're going to go all over the place now. <laughs> all right, we're getting experimental. Totally. Uh, okay, so jumping forward to 2015. Are you an experimental filmmaker? Do, do, does that title yes. resonate with you? What does that even mean? Yes. Uh, well, you know, it, it means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Uh, experimental film has changed shape a lot since, you know, the beginnings of cinema. Um, you know, since the, the 20s even. Um, and, you know, I think it's, it's almost kind of an umbrella term uh, to describe a lot of more alternative uh, or non-mainstream type film practices. So it could mean a lot of different things. Uh, it depends on your style and your aesthetic. Uh, but basically it, it means uh, to not uh, try and participate in reproducing the same old kind of thing that we've all seen before, you know, the, the mainstream sort of Hollywood slash TV paradigm of storytelling. You hate Hollywood, don't you? No, no, not at all. I love it. I love it. But it's not what I'm interested in making. Mm. Um, so I like to tell, you know, kind of more um, individualized styles of stories. Um, and uh, maybe that has a direct relationship with the amount of appeal that the stories will have, you know. Uh, more broad the style, the more broad the appeal but that's okay too. Uh, so yeah, I would describe myself as an experimental filmmaker. I certainly watch and consume and, and think about a lot of experimental films, so I guess that only makes sense. But, uh, you know, what I make as an experimental film might be completely, radically, totally different from what someone else would make as an experimental film because it's so idiosyncratic and it's so bound up with the individual. It's uh, more akin to, I guess, uh, being like a singer-songwriter. You know, where everyone has their own kind of individual voice and their own songwriting style. Let's say you walk into a room, a party, or mm -hmm. friends, whatever, and there's ten people, and they all love film. Out of those ten, how many of them love experimental film? Probably zero. Really? <laughs> uh, well, it's it's a very you know kind of uh, niche sort of uh, practice, I guess, because. You know, it's not really shown much on television. You know, you, you don't see it in a commercial theater or anything. Um, you really have to kind of seek it out. Um, so it, it's not sort of being advertised to us uh, or it doesn't surround us in the culture as much as Hollywood film does. You know, with Hollywood film, there's bus ads and there's newspaper ads and there's TV spots and there's Super Bowl ads and there's radio advertisements and, mm -hmm. you know, you're constantly exposed to it. Uh, you know, web ads, you know, God knows what else. Uh, with experimental film, there's a lot less, um, you know, kind of put out there about it. So the people who like it, you know, have to really do the work to, to find it, really. It's uh, it's kind of like being a little archaeologist in a way. You have to kind of find where in your city, what underground location is showing all of the the experimental films and then sort of dig down deep in there. Uh, but, you know, that that's fun. That makes it more kind of, uh, more of a, a passion and more of a hobby, I guess, because you have to work at it a little. Which global audiences or which countries are really, uh, really like experimental films? Or which countries, which countries are experimental films uh, more, more, uh, more mainstream, or maybe mm. not so much mainstream, but which countries are more open to 
right. experimental film. Uh, I think that there's a direct relationship between which countries produce the most experimental film uh, and those countries that have the highest degree of access to uh, teachings about experimental film, basically. So, you know, if you look at countries that have uh, the most, uh, you know, film studies programs, the most film schools, uh, the most uh, cinematechs that do, uh, you know, legacy and retrospective programming or repertory programming, um, you know, where that kind of material is available, I think you'll find the stimulus is there and that the filmmaking community kind of grows up around those. Um, you can also find a direct relationship between uh, countries that produce a lot of experimental film and countries that uh, have a lot of uh, generous art support uh, mm. in terms of uh, municipal, provincial, or, yeah. or federal uh, kind of grants, right. uh, programs, initiatives, uh, scholarships, mentorships, opportunities like that, mm. uh, because those are often uh, big stimuli, stimuli as well. Um, and the reason for that is that uh, experimental film is uh, essentially a non-commercial form. Uh, it's of, real art. Uh, I, I, I'm throwing. I'm throwing this. At yeah, you. sure. Um, yeah. <laughs> I don't. I'm not sure if I know what real art is. I don't. Yeah. It, it sounds oxymoronic, right? Real art, you know. But yeah. yeah. Right. Right. Uh, but yeah, I, I get what you mean. Um, Shouldn't all films be experimental? Uh, well, you know, everyone has a right to make a buck. Mm -hmm. So if someone wants to run, uh, you know, some kind of a film studio or something for a commercial purpose and for a profit, then they're welcome to it, I guess. You know, mm -hmm. I'm not one to tell anyone uh, what they should and shouldn't, uh, you know, make a dollar from. Right. Um, that's their business. But uh, I do feel very strongly that not all types of film can make a profit. And not all types of art in general can make a profit. Mm. Um, some of them are just not saleable. They can't be packaged and commercialized as easily as some others. And that goes for music, that goes for books, that goes for all sorts of things. And uh, I think it's those types of uh, artistic expression that need the most help and mm. need the most support to get out there to the public uh, because oftentimes those are the types of art that will be expressing uh, unpopular or uh, different or alternative points of view. Um, the thing about commercial art, uh, you know, Hollywood films, for instance, or, or mainstream TV, uh, they can be very well done, they can be very entertaining, they can be a lot of, you know, uh, you know, fun, but uh, very rarely will they say anything truly challenging. Mm. Um, so non-commercial forms of art exist to uh, continue to ask questions and to challenge us, and uh, that's a valuable service. So I think that's why uh, art should be supported. No doubt. And how is Ottawa uh, as far as an audience for experimental uh, and alternative film? How, how is this city? It's pretty good. It's pretty good, uh, considering that we have two universities that uh, both have uh, film production, um, or rather, you know, one has film studies, one has film production, uh, and we also have, um, you know, uh, this Canadian Film Institute that does a lot of retrospective programming. Um, there are other groups in town like uh, Saw Video and Available Light Screening Collective that do retrospective programming um, as well as contemporary. Uh, so that there's a lot of people basically showing and discussing and disseminating uh, experimental film in the city, then, you know, um, a filmmaking community kind of grows up around that, basically. Uh, and so, you know, uh, you, you can't create that kind of uh, art in a bubble, in mm -hmm. isolation. You have to be shown examples and, you know, get inspired and compare and contrast and have a dialogue basically uh, with other filmmakers about what they're doing and it all kind of comes out of the difference and the contrast between people so uh, yeah the fact that there are so many organizations uh, and institutions in Ottawa uh, that relate to film I think is what makes it a healthy scene. What what inspired, uh, I think you, 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 you've said it, but what inspired you to, to start the, the film festival? Uh, well, I had the idea of doing Mirror Mountain uh, Film Festival sometime in about September or October of 2014. Uh, but it's not like it just kind of hit me out of the blue. 
uh, because I have been involved in putting on a lot of screenings um, and other types of uh, film-related events in Ottawa for a very, very long time. Uh, I worked as the programmer at Saw Video for a number of years. You know, I started going there long enough that they started paying me to be there. <laughs> <laughs> That's how often I was there. Uh, and I still there. I still go there a lot. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, after even now that I don't work there anymore, I still am there all the time. Mm. Uh, just being a community member. And, um, you know, before that, um, I also was a programmer with Available Light Screening Collective. So I did uh, screenings and other types of activity uh, in the Ottawa area uh, for many years, you know, curated a lot of different programs for them. So it was kind of just sort of an extension of that. It's like, okay, I've been putting on these film events for years. How about just putting on something slightly bigger and slightly more kind of packaged together rather than put on six screenings over the course of 14 months? How about I put them on in the course of three days hmm. uh, and just kind of uh, do that basically as a as a job. Um, so I'm basically doing the same kind of work that I was doing before, except now I'm, you know, basically working on my own steam, uh, and on my own hours and I get to be my own boss, which is great. So mm -hmm. that's super. Um, I've always wanted to, you know, be an entrepreneur and kind of work for myself and have my own company and all that kind of stuff. So I get to do that. But I also felt like it was a good opportunity, uh, because, there wasn't really another film festival in Ottawa that was doing what I wanted to do. So basically what I was doing was creating, or will be doing anyway, it hasn't happened yet, uh, is creating the festival that I want to see. Nice. Uh, That's dope. You know, if there was a festival that fulfilled that need for me, I wouldn't be doing it mm -hmm. because I would just go to that. Um, and yeah, I had been definitely influenced by seeing a lot of other uh, film festivals along my my journeys. I guess you know, as a as a filmmaker, I've uh, encountered and experienced and dealt with many, many, many festivals. Um, not to say that I've been screened in many, many, many festivals, but you know, I've uh, at least you know communicated with many of them. Often just to hear that they haven't accepted my film for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. uh, but basically, you know, I. I had a very good long look at what's out there in terms of film festivals before I started this one. And I feel like I did an audit. I did an yeah. audit. Yes, yeah, yes. that's a good way of putting it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And basically I put all of the best stuff into this one. Nice. Uh and you know, took out all of the stuff that I felt wasn't working mm. about other festivals and left them to one side. Uh so it's just kind of like a super festival. What can we expect from this festival? Like it's the unexpected. Really? Absolutely. Elaborate on that. The unexpected in... in I guess we just need to show up. <laughs> when is it happening? In December? Yeah? It's happening for three days in December. Mm -hmm. uh, December 4th, 5th, and 6th. Friday, Saturday, Sunday. It's happening all at uh, Gallery Saw Gallery and Club Saw in the Arts Court building. And uh, it's going to comprise of a mixture of... Um, screenings obviously uh some uh, spoken word events like a panel discussion that we've got coming up uh we've also got uh an artist talk uh we're gonna have um several parties uh some of them with live music cool. we're gonna have all sorts of things but uh in terms of uh what the actual film content will be we're focusing on material that's a bit more left of center than what people are used to um and this is what uh, I think uh, we don't really have much of in the city. I mean, we have many, many, many fine film festivals in Ottawa. Uh, stupendous, in fact. We have some of the best film festivals in the country here. Really? Absolutely. Absolutely. We've got the uh, Animation Festival, which is in, I think, its 25th or 6th year now. It's been a juggernaut. It's fantastic. Mm. Uh, we've got a really good uh, festival called One World, which is uh, devoted to uh, mainly documentary mm -hmm. uh, practice um, that uh, touches on you know global issues, uh, environmental issues, that kind of thing. Sure. Um, there is um, the Cellar Door Film Festival, which uh, is devoted to uh, you know science fiction and horror and fantasy films. Uh, there's even an Irish film festival now. Uh, there's a Human Rights Film Festival. Um, Gosh, there's, there's probably a dozen more I'm forgetting right now, but they're all very, very specialized. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, so the, there's an appetite for that. Is, is Ottawa, the Ottawa Gatineau area, uh, a good market for, for all these festivals? Oh, uh, yeah. I, I think be, that, yeah. that demonstrates that there's a huge thirst for culture. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. That people are, are hungry uh, for more. Uh, that they want to see films. That they like to go out and, and you know be exposed to uh, ideas and you know to uh, experiences that they haven't had before. How are you guys uh, at this uh, the festival? How are you going to market and communicate uh, this festival in terms of alternative cinema? Because there there could be room for uh, it's an opportunity, uh, obviously. There mm-hmm. could be room for a lot of uh, a- a- education on what alternative cinema is. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I feel like uh, we are definitely working towards uh, taking that opportunity full on. You know, We want it, the festival to be uh, beneficial to filmmakers mm-hmm. and just to the general public, really, uh, in terms of being informative and educational. Uh, but of course, without making it you know, a lecture. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's not like school. You don't have sure, to take notes. Sure. Right. Uh, but like, for example, we're going to be having a, a panel discussion on issues of uh, diversity and inclusion in contemporary mm-hmm. filmmaking uh, with an aim towards giving uh, filmmakers who might want to show up or, or just anyone who wants to learn mm-hmm. uh, out of interest uh, kind of almost like a toolbox of initiatives and things that they can do themselves to help make film a more diverse place even in our own communities never cool. mind Hollywood but right, right here at home mm-hmm. um, so like that's just one example but uh, we, we really believe that um, you know, film is uh, a fantastic, uh, diverse place for all people to join in on. Uh, and we feel like, you know, there could really be a lot more work done to make that a reality. Um, so that's kind of uh, the lines on which we'll be communicating uh, about the festival to the public. You know, that's the sort of our talking points, I guess. Sure. How many films do you guys uh, plan on, on screening uh, overall? That's hard to say. Um, at this point, you know, it depends on how long the films are, of course. Um, you know, the shorter they are, the more you can fit in. But at this point, I believe we're probably looking at about between 70 and 90 short films wow. and about three features. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. What, um, you got any sponsors? Uh, well, we're working on that. Okay. Uh, yeah, we do have some. We have um, definitely uh, a great selection of uh, sponsors that uh, you can check out on our website. Uh, some local businesses that have uh, already decided to get on board and uh, take part, which is fantastic. Uh, but we are definitely seeking more. <laughs> cool. Uh, so are, are these the current ones? Are they confirmed? Oh, yes, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Do you mind selling them? Oh, sure, sure. You are just to, yeah. you know, tell them that uh, they're doing... Yeah, they're, they're supporting absolutely. art. So yeah, yeah, plug them, man. <laughs> absolutely, I'd be happy to. Uh, well, uh, we have had received uh, very generous in-kind donations from uh, Art Engine and from uh, Gallery Cell Gallery, uh, which are going to be just essential for being able to run the festival at a very professional standard of presentation. Uh, Gallery Cell Gallery, of course, are the organization that are hosting us. Uh, so they've donated uh, the use of their gallery space. Um, with not just the club, I don't know if you've ever been to Club Saw, but uh, not just the screening room, but also the whole exhibition space, because it just so happens that they won't be having an exhibition on uh, during those days in December. Mm. So they're like, oh, sure, you know, we'll donate the gallery for whatever your needs are, which means that we'll be able to uh, hold uh, much larger events because the capacity will be larger, and we'll be able to do more expansive things like uh, panel discussions and talks. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Art Engine, which are um, an organization that are also based in Arts Court, uh, devoted to new media, uh, are very nicely donating to us uh, the use of their 8,000 lumen projector. That's a lot of lumens. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> most indoor projectors have a lumen range of about uh, 2,000 to 4,000, and that affects how bright they are. Uh, this is an 8,000 lumen projector, so that's bright. Um, so uh, it's going to be an extremely clear and sharp, high-definition video image that we're going to get to enjoy, thanks to them. Uh, we also have a sponsorship from Ottawa Rickshaws. They're our diamond-level sponsor. Uh, they are uh, very generously donating uh, some printing needs for us that we need uh, in terms of uh, being able to produce lovely, uh, perfect-bound festival catalogs uh, that people can take home as a souvenir uh, that will tell them all about the films that are in the festival. 
uh, and we'll also kind of leave a bit more of a, a permanent uh, reminder, I guess, or memento of the festival. And um, we've also got a great uh, local restaurant uh, called Clover, which have joined us as a sponsor. Um, and this was a restaurant uh, that is uh, started by a former chef from Zen Kitchen, uh, which I don't know if you know, but recently closed down mm -hmm. uh, in Chinatown. And now it, the former chef has uh, kind of reinvigorated that sort of uh, approach to uh, sustainable, locally grown uh, organic foods, uh, you know, with mm -hmm. gourmet recipes uh, at a new restaurant called Clover, and we're very glad to have them on board. Can uh, filmmakers still submit? Are you still, uh, is there a submission, mm -hmm. or are you still accepting films? Absolutely. We're open until October 31st for submissions, uh, but we've been actually open for submissions for a long time now. We've been open since last October okay. of 2014. Um, so uh, we have already long since passed our uh, early bird deadlines, uh, which means that we're, I think, in extended deadline territory now. We're not quite up to final deadline uh, stage, but we're almost there, uh, which means that, you know, uh, the fees are starting to get higher and higher. Uh, but uh, the good news is, is that uh, we are free to submit to for local filmmakers all the way up until the end of October uh, because we uh, want to support and stimulate the local filmmaking community. And uh, we have decided to make uh, it free for them at all times of the year to submit. So uh, local filmmakers can submit as many films as they want. It doesn't matter how old they are, how new they are, what they're about, what genre. They don't have to be experimental films. Uh, they don't have to be any kind of film. They can be whatever kind of film the filmmaker wants them to be. In fact, the more individualized they are, the more we want them, I suppose. Um, so uh, filmmakers should know that uh, they don't have to make films that look just like everybody else's films in order to get into film festivals. They can make a film that only they would be able to make, and that's the kind of film we want. We're five months away from uh, from the festival, yeah? Mm -hmm. How are you feeling? Pumped, really excited, uh, very, very enthusiastic, um, starting to feel that kind of just friction, you know, generating electricity in the air. Mm. Um, you know, I've been doing events for a very, very long time, and the analogy I always use uh, for them, you know, how you set up a really good event, it's like a wind-up toy, uh, like, you know, the kind you would get at a Christmas stocking or something mm -hmm. with the little little dial on yeah, the side, yeah. you know, little alligator <laughs> feet moving. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and the way to create a good event is just to make sure that all your elements are in place and that they're all fully wound up. Mm -hmm. And then when the day of the event comes, all you got to do is just let it go. And then the event will run itself. Everything will happen. Everything will fall into place uh, because you've done all of the pre-production. You've done all of the prep work to make it happen. You've put all the things in place. You've seen it from, you know, all the different angles and so forth. Uh, so right now I'm just enjoying cranking this up just as far as it'll go. Uh, and I'm just really enjoying feeling that friction. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. I'm looking forward to checking out uh, the, the festival. And uh, thank you very much for, for talking to us. Thank you. Thanks for having me. For more information, visit garmami.com. That's G-A-R-M-A-M-I-E dot com. G-A-R-M-A-M-I-E dot com.